What I should have did was before I made my offer, before I wasted my time to go look at the damn house in person, <laughs> I should have asked this dude, like I normally do, is there anybody else that, you know, you need to speak to before making this final decision to sell the property? Mm. Oh, damn. Right? I make him the offer. He said, I need to speak to my wife. He goes and says, well, you know, I want to sell it, but she wants to hold on to it for, you know, another six months. First of all, what the hell is another six months going to do? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's going on, millionaires? It's your guy, Kai Speaks, back with another episode of the Million Dollar Mind podcast, where we bring in entrepreneurship, money, mindset, and all the above, all the action-taking skills that you need to become a better version of yourself day by day. Man, we got my man Tyquan Franklin in the building, and for those that are true fans, you know, the real listeners of the podcast, y'all remember we had Ty on the pod back a year, like a year ago, right? About a year ago, yeah. About a year ago, um, as we was capturing his journey into wholesaling. And um, man, that was a great conversation, but what I realized about it, it was virtual. Yep. Now that we have this beautiful studio, I finally get to have my mans in the studio, live in full effect for this in-person smoke, this in-person gas that he about to give y'all, because man, a lot of things have changed in the real estate market. And um, Todd, before we even dive in, I want you to tell our listeners about your journey, you know, briefly on like how you got into wholesaling and I guess some of the things that you've learned mm -hmm. was pivoting with the market like we talked about earlier. Yeah, so um, appreciate you having me on again, mm -hmm. you know, this time in person. I appreciate yeah. it. Love the studio. For sure. Fire. So um, the way I got into wholesaling, man, I was I was working a, a, a eight to five job just like everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. um, just like everybody else. I mean, eight out. to five. The eight extra to five. Hour, no yeah. much. Ain't no nine to five. <laughs> eight to five. You come in at eight, you leave at five. Yeah. Um, sometimes six or seven. So I was working eight to five job. I was working at a logistics company, trucking company. I was a third party. It was a third party logistics company, uh, brokerage company. So, you know, I was working there for seven years. And um, I just got tired of the going back and forth to work, driving back and forth to work. I wanted some more freedom. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, COVID had hit. I was I was a six figure earner there. Uh, and then once COVID kind of hit, uh, my account started to diminish, diminish mm -hmm. right? And I just started losing the motivation and the juice for um, working for somebody else at that point. I said, I already built my business here. If it's gone, I'm not gonna work for this company again. So. Uh, I started getting into wholesaling a little bit. I did my research online, Google, um, how to get into real estate without using money and all this and that. Went down a rabbit hole on YouTube, uh, started listening to videos, you know, the Max Maxwells, the, the you know, Wholesale to Millions with Kong, mm -hmm. um, all these different people. And started learning how to wholesale real estate. And I looked at it and I said, okay, this is the same thing that I was doing in trucking but with a different product in a different mm. industry right I'm, I'm a broker i'm a third party person right yeah. so i'm just connecting the dots i'm connecting the buyer with the seller essentially right and mm -hmm. the product is the property or the contract in this in this instance so um i just started taking action you know so after my job i would go home and i would just start doing different things that i'm learning on youtube i would you know i'll drive for dollars i would start right now at property addresses mm. I would put out bandit signs on Fridays at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, and then come to find out they was taken up on Monday. Um, I would cold call. I would start texting. I would do all these different things, and it wasn't working at the moment, right? So what I started doing, I started honing in on one thing that I was good at, which was talking on the phone, right? And I was trying to get to that 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 deal faster, you know? So. You know, I started seeing all people's success on on YouTube, on Instagram, on social media, and I said, okay, if they can do it, I can do it, right? I had the skill set. I've been talking to billion dollar companies, million dollar companies for this trucking company mm -hmm. for the past six, seven years. I can talk to a, a person who owns a hundred fifty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand house, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, that was my whole mindset behind it. I said, if they can do it, I can do it. So from there, I'll just come home. I would cold call for about an hour and a half, just calling, 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 calling. Hey, you want to sell your house? Hey, you want to sell your house? Hey, you want to sell your house? And, you know, it started to pick up. I started getting leads, started talking to people that had some interest in selling the properties. And from there, I would just take it step by step. I would do something, then I would learn something, and I would apply it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's the key. Like, whenever you learn something, don't sit on that information. Yeah. You have to apply that information yeah. immediately. Got right? to apply it. Immediately. So, 
um, um, applied knowledge is the power, right? Knowledge is not pl- power. Applied knowledge is power because mm-hmm. that's when you actually use it. So I started using all these things that I was learning and I failed along the way, right? Some things didn't work. Some things did, right? So from that point, I started learning, okay, well, I'm not going to close a deal in 30 days like they were saying on Instagram <laughs> and YouTube, right. right? I'm not. So I'm getting into month two, month three. That's of clickbait, me. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's clickbait, right? Close a deal in 30 days, $20,000. Yeah, right. But you don't know what transpired before the 30 days to get that deal done. Mm-hmm. So once I started getting into month two, month three, I started realizing, okay, I need some more resources. So I started investing some money into software that's going to help me do this faster because I was just using my cell phone, Google Voice, dialing one by one, text messaging one by one. I didn't have any resources to try to find out what the comps were for these properties. So I was like, okay, how did I be? How, how can I be more efficient with the minimal amount of time that I have? Because like I said, I'm doing this after work yeah. for an hour and a half. Yeah. So how can I talk to more people in a shorter period of time? So I invested in software, right? I invested in the dialer so I can call people in the, in the, call more people in a shorter period of time. I invested in the software so I can analyze the deals, right? and know what numbers to offer and things along those lines. So once I invested in that software, it started making me a little bit more efficient and I had the tools, right? You can't build a house with no tools, right? So uh, I started having the tools that I needed to actually close the deal or get the deal done. And from there, just started working it, working and working it, came across this lead. She wanted to sell. This was in, you know, two hours away from where I live. It was in Hogansville, Georgia, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? You drove out there? I drove out there. (laughs) I didn't drive out there the first time. I drove out there to close. Yeah, to close. But I hired somebody, not hired somebody, but basically hired somebody. I had I hired a real estate agent, a realtor, to go out there to take the photos for me. Yeah, right. Okay. I found her on Facebook. Say, hey, I need photos of this property. Can you take photos? I paid 50 bucks. So she went, took photos, took videos, and sent them to me. So I seen what the property was without even had to go out there. I just paid her 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. And then um, from there, I was looking for a buyer on that deal. Now, mind you, this time, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about no formula. The formula didn't make sense to me at the time. I didn't know. I was just failing forward, right? I was just learning as I go. Just throwing offers just out throwing there. Just throwing offers <laughs> out there. I saw some cash sales on one of the softwares for like 50000 and the lady wanted thirty five. I said, okay, if they sold this house down the street for 50000 and she wants thirty five, I should be able to do something with that, mm-hmm. right? So I locked the deal up, and that's what I did. And then from there... I couldn't find a buyer. I'm running late on my on my contract. I'm mm-hmm. like on the last week of my contract. So I asked the realtor, I said, hey, do you know anybody that may be interested in this deal? So she passed me. The one that t- took the photos. The one that took the photos. Okay. I said, do you know anyone else that might be interested in this deal? Any buyers? She said, I don't have any buyers, but I do have this my other agent right here. So she had an agent that she knew, and he actually had a buyer that was interested in a deal and we worked together and we got the deal done. So on this deal, we only made like $4,000, mm-hmm. paid him a thousand bucks and I walked away with three grand and that was my first deal. And it was all from just taking action, moving forward, learning what I was learning and applying it and mm-hmm. just failing forward. And six months, you know, that's when I got my first deal. Yeah. How, how did that feel though? Being able to get your first deal from all that you talk about all the videos you watched on Ooh. YouTube, all the hours of calling people, all the no's you probably heard. Ooh. How did that first deal closing feel like? Bro, it felt a lot of pressure off of your back, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's like, I got, I got to do, I got to close the deal. I got to close the deal. I got to close the deal, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's also like, oh, I can do this, right? Oh, this is real. Yeah, it's like that proof of concept. Proof of concept. Mm-hmm. Like, this is legit. So, yeah, you can close these deals without having a high credit score using your credit. Yeah, you can close these deals without having a real estate license, right? Yeah, you can close these deals without having experience, right? Without prior experiences mm-hmm. or anything like that. So I was like, okay, if I can do I can do it once, I can do it 100 times over. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I can make three grand, I can make 30, 30 grand on the deal. Yeah. And that's that's that was my mindset from it because I also failed before that, right? I had put properties on the contract before that that didn't sell. Okay. okay. And, you know, I had to terminate, had to cancel. I almost got scammed on one because somebody was trying to scam the homeowner, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with Craigslist. So I dealt with that stuff on the front end. And this was like the third contract that I had that I actually went forward with through every process because each contract I was going through each process with, right? Yeah. One, okay, the price was too, the price was that I offered was too, it wasn't good enough, right, mm-hmm. for my buyer, or the area wasn't good. Then I'm learning as these contracts are not going through. So this third one, 
it was taking me through each step. Now, you know, I got the contract, the price is good. Got the buyer, the price is good. Now I'm going through the, the closing process. So I learned how to do that. Yeah. And everything worked out. Man, so you you mentioned how like you had to fail before you got this first, Absolutely. This first deal. Talk about the, cause not everybody talks about what it looks like. Everybody think that you get a deal, it's gonna close, right? Yeah. They think that, okay, you're gonna hear no's, but once you get the contract, it's gonna close, but not that's just all. not the case. Like it's gonna be a lot of contracts you lock up mm -hmm. that's just not going close and you got to have those tough conversations yep. what do those conversations look like how do you handle the 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 process of telling someone who you once sold a dream like i'm gonna buy mm -hmm. your home to now i gotta back out of this deal like mm -hmm. how did that conversation go for a lot of these deals that's a good question so for me in this real estate business period, it's all about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Relationships are very important. And with relationships comes transparency and accountability, right? And being honest, Facts. right? So yeah, coming into it, I thought, like my intentions wasn't to sell you a dream and not get this done. My intent was to get this done. I'm not gonna put a property on a contract or try to move forward with something that I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. So it's just having that honest conversation, being transparent and taking accountability for being wrong. Right. Yeah. And not making it work. So it's just having the conversation with the homeowner saying, hey, you know, Mr. Seller, like, um, you know, my intentions would appear, you know, we thought we can get this done. But unfortunately, the property is going to need a little bit more work than we anticipated. We do want to buy the property, though. But it has to be. at this But price. we need it at this price. Got you. And if that don't work, then it's like. And if, 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 if you don't agree to this price, I completely understand. We can actually terminate, move forward. But to be completely honest, you may be able to get a higher price than what we're offering you here. So if if I were you, I would probably move forward with terminating the deal and move and, 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 and try to get that higher price. Got you. Got you. So you still at some point you want to advance it. Mm -hmm. It's just more so trying to renegotiate terms, maybe the price, mm -hmm. you know, try to make it work. And then at that point, you know, letting them you kind of anchoring them to where they like yep. don't even want to fuck with it so yep. you just kind of like all right you could walk away and then you could walk away scotch 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 you know. free like yeah, yeah we'll we'll take care of the attorney fees or anything there's no liability to you at all we'll just send you over a termination agreement and we can just part ways and if you do decide to come back to us we'll be at this price and we can move forward and that's happened before as well yeah speaking of like attorney fees and stuff like this too mm -hmm. right um for the people that are looking at this been thinking about wholesaling, mm -hmm. can't find the right mentor, don't know where to start, right? And they just don't have enough information. And they might be on limited funds because you mentioned you can do this, you know, not having to have great credit, mm -hmm. you know, taking out loans to start this business. Right. You could you could use the 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 loan of your time yep. to start this business. With those attorney fees though, when you have contracts that close, are there still fees that you have to worry about paying with the attorney if you can't close a deal? And so like, what is the upfront capital that somebody should look to have in their back pocket for those incidentals and stuff like that? So the only incidental that I would say, because here's the thing, the contract, your contract is going to protect you, mm -hmm. right? So whatever contract you have is and whatever verbiage that you have in your contract, that's going to protect you. So uh, for example, the earnest money, right? Because there's a lot of questions about earnest money. Yeah. A lot of people have questions about earnest money. Oh, how much earnest money and should I put on my- What is earnest money for those who- um, heard Earnest it. money is pretty much good faith money. This is pretty much saying, hey, this is how serious I am about buying this particular property, gotcha. right? You put this money in place up front, essentially, mm -hmm. um, to the title company to saying that, hey, this is this is my, my money that's telling you that I want to purchase mm -hmm. a property. The lower the earnest money, the less confident somebody is going to be in you is trying to buy the property. Mm -hmm. I know starting out, you hear all these used to videos and Instagram videos about putting a dollar on as for earnest money so or ten dollars. No, no earnest money. We ain't even bring it up unless you bring it up. <laughs> Y'all got away with it. So what we do, we always put a thousand dollars on the earnest money, mm -hmm. right? And the way the verbiage in our contracts is set up is it doesn't say earnest money need to be submitted within forty eight hours of this agreement. No, it just says earnest money may, must be submitted to the title company. Period. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't mean that could be the day of closing. The it, day before. Day closing, before. Yeah. It could be whenever. Right. So that was that's what protects us with the earnest money. And then also our due diligence period. Right. That's the part of the contract. If you don't terminate that deal within your due diligence period, then you might be liable more than likely if the seller comes after you you will be liable for that earnest money. Mm -hmm. So any contract that we have with a seller, we make sure we make the final decision 
before the end of our due diligence period. Right. That way we're not liable to pay any incidentals of that earnest money. Which so, was giving yourself like 14 days? We do 15. 15, okay. Business days. Business days. days. <laughs> <laughs> Three yeah, weeks. Make it clear. Business days. <laughs> Business days. So, um, you know, the earn. So that's why you, you really don't need any money up front to mm -hmm. do this as long as your paperwork is correct and you do what you need to do as far as your paperwork is, is concerned, right? So that's how we operate. We operate within the confines of our contract, mm -hmm. which allows us not to have to fork up any money incidentally, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as far as closing costs and title fees and things like that with the attorney, if you do send a contract to the attorney and they're running title search on that, they may ask you for a fee, right? That mm -hmm. fee could be 250 bucks or something like that. But the way we prevent that is we don't send any contracts to the title company unless we have a buyer in place and getting this thing to close. Right, right. So, so you're not dealing with those. Exactly. So once we get a property in a contract with a seller, we're not sending that property. We're not sending that contract to the title company to run a title search yet. No, not at all. We're going to wait till we get a buyer in place first, mm -hmm. and then we'll send both of those agreements to the title company. That way, if anything happens, that buyer is going to be responsible for bailing out on the deal or whatever the case may be or any of those title fees or whatever the case may be. Right, right. And as a wholesaler, you're in a very interesting position because you are the only person in the transaction that is both the buyer and the seller. Yep. And then you have a buyer that mm -hmm. is the end buyer, and then you have a seller that is the beginning of this transaction. Um, so, like, let's talk about the dynamic of the wholesaler in these situations to be able to have the capacity to understand both buying situations and selling situations on each transaction. Yeah, so like you said, you essentially, hell, you you probably playing the role of a real estate agent too because you got to market the property mm -hmm. out. Oh, yeah. You know yeah, what I'm true. saying? So. Um, and then also deal with the title company. So you're playing a lot of different roles as a wholesaler. And it's very important to know exactly what's going on with each role, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, yeah, because at a certain point, you want to kind of hire certain these parts out, yeah. right? So you need to understand how to handle it and how to operate it as such, right? So, yeah, you have to be the person that's the acquisitions guy or the acquisitions person that's going out to acquire the deal, to find the deal. Right, and to get the deal under contract. Then you have to be the marketing person, right? You have to be able to market to these homeowners to, to bring in those leads. And then from there, once you get the contract, you have to be able to sell it, right? You have to be able to con contact and connect with cash buyers and negotiate with cash buyers and market your deal out to cash buyers and get another contract mm -hmm. to sell it. And then from there, you have to also be able to understand the title process. Right. Because after that, there's another process in order, another step that you need to take to finish the race. Right. You have to take this deal through closing through title. So the title process isn't really you don't have, you don't have to be that hands on with it. But mm -hmm. you do need to understand how that works. Right. That way you can advise your seller and there's no delays on closing. Yeah. You know, but the dynamic is crazy. You really do need to understand both sides of the spectrum as far as you know, dealing with the seller, dealing with the buyer and putting those two together. Because if you don't, that's when things start falling apart and you don't get deals done that way. Yeah. And in the beginning, I'm sure you got to be like over curious with these title companies, with the closing attorneys to be able to, when you don't understand something, ask, like mm -hmm. ask these title companies because they really are your, you should be able to, the relationship you have with anybody in this transaction, you should be striving to maintain a healthy relationship with your title company and or Absolutely. Closing attorney of uh, out of everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's let's talk about that because I'm sure you aim to work with the same title company every every deal if you could. Yep. Yep. And the reason why because they're they're your counsel, right? Mm -hmm. So even if we have a question and we don't have a deal in title with them right now, we can ask them a question about something because they know who we are. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of business with them. Mm -hmm. So anything relating to real estate with title, even if it's not on a property that they are working on we can ask them that question because it's like free counsel. Yeah, we done made you some money at this We done point. made you some money. We're partners, right? We're partners in this. We're bringing you business, and in exchange for that business, we want the information, right? So having those relationships with the title company is good because, you know, you can avoid not getting deals done, right? Because some title companies, they're not going to go to bat for you as, as they should, mm -hmm. right? So if you have a, comp a title company that you've built a relationship with that you consistently bring in deals to, that you actually see them in person, you actually do things for them, 
right? Um, our title company, we bought them charcuterie boards one time. We get them Chick Fil A gift cards, Treat things like that, right? So um, it's more of a, a, a team effort, and by doing those things, that's going to put us as a high profile client for them. So they like, okay, whenever Property Jed and Ty comes over here and I have a question, we have to address it, right? We have to make sure that we take care of them because they take care of us, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So having that that relationship is very important because you have other title companies that may not even put in the effort to, to get these deals done. They might just toss it to the side and they're tossing it to the side because they have other people that they have relationships with that they are putting ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So um, build those relationships with the title companies. Yeah. Very poor. What does that process look like in the beginning though? Especially if, you know, uh, rewind it to your first deal mm -hmm. before you got this first deal and you're looking for a title company, you don't have a proof of concept yet, mm -hmm. you don't have a relationship with them yet, they're not even faithful that you can even close deals. Mm -hmm. What are like some questions that you ask in these title companies when you was in the process of shopping around, trying to find that one that you wanted to work with, you know, giving people some context on like, what are some like, of the best questions you can ask to make sure you find somebody that's going to go to bat for you uh, and even how to position yourself mm -hmm. as somebody they even want to spend time with. Right. So I think uh, a good question to ask a title company when you reach out to them, because a lot of people are going to say, what is wholesale friendly title companies? Most of them, they, they know they know what the wholesale transaction is, right? Mm -hmm. They know assignments, they know double closings and things like that. So that's one question you could ask. Do you guys do assignments and double close? That's, that's front and center. Do they prefer... Do most of them, and not not to cut you off, yeah, yeah. do most of them prefer assignments over double closes or vice versa? It don't even matter because okay. they're going to get paid regardless. You got you. You know what I'm saying? So it don't matter for them. Um, another question is, you know, how often are you working with investors, right? Wholesalers, because they know who wholesalers are. If they've done, done assignments and double closings and things like that, they understand that transaction. They understand what a wholesaler is. So you want to find out how often they're working with wholesalers, right? So you can see if this person, if this title company is a fit, because if they're if they're not working with wholesalers that often, then you might not want to work with these people in, mm, pers okay. in particular. Right. You want to work with somebody who has the experience that are consistently seeing wholesale deals and they know how to manage that transaction. Right. Because there's title companies that we've worked with that they they seem like they didn't know what a wholesale transaction or assign, assignment transaction was. Right. And we had to tell them how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of times when we're giving, telling them their job, yeah. right? So we need to be getting paid by them too. But um, that's a good question to ask. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as I got, man. You know, because the title company, they're going to do what they're going to do. As long as you, you communicate with them, you stay on top of them. Um, you let them know, hey, I do wholesale deals, even if you haven't done any deals yet. Hey, mm -hmm. I, I, I do two, two to three deals a month, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm looking for a good title company. Just want to know if you guys, you know, how often you guys work with wholesalers, how often you do assignments, how mm -hmm. often you do double closes. Um, you know, what's the typical time frame on you guys pulling title and getting the title search completed? Yeah. Because that's important. Usually it should take about a week. Yeah. It should take about a week. It take longer than that. Something's going you on. You got to go to somebody else. You got to go to somebody else, you know, so. Um, the title company, their job is to take this thing to closing, but it's your job to make sure you stay on top of them to make sure that it does go to closing by contacting them consistently once a week. Hey, what's the status on this on this file? Mm -hmm. And kind of seeing if there anything else that you know you guys need from us or you need from the seller to get this thing closed without any issues, right? Yeah. So ask that in advance too. Yeah, you don't want to ask that the day before or at closing. Right. And he's like, you need this document that got to get notarized, right? Like, right. Shit like that come up all the oh, time. Oh man. Yeah. So, to give our give our listeners some clarity on the difference between assignments and double closings because I've been familiar with some attorneys don't even like working with double closings. Mm -hmm. And it is helpful to know what that process looks like so mm -hmm. that people can understand why an attorney might not be open to doing a double closing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, for you personally, do you like assignments or double closings more? I like assignments. Mm, interesting. It's, it's quicker. Okay, interesting. That it, makes sense. It's quicker. I, we only, we really only rock with double, double closes. Yeah, it would be rare that we did an assignment, but definitely get that clarity on yeah. what the difference is. So assignments and double closing is a good question too, because a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on you as the wholesaler and sometimes the buyer as far as what which side they want to do. Do they want to do assignment or double close? Because like we know, hedge funds they primarily most of them they only want to do double closes, mm -hmm. right? Um, local buyers, they don't mind doing assignments. So with an assignment, it's essentially you get the property on a contract, right, with the seller. 
And then when you find your buyer, you give them an assignment agreement, assignment contract, right? And that's pretty much assigning the rights of that property to that end buyer, mm -hmm. right? And with that, it's an easy transaction. It's just two contracts, right? Now, when you get into the, the, the double close, it's essentially two closes, right? You have a close in between, let's say you're my seller. Me and you have an agreement. And we and we yeah, gonna we, close. On we that gonna agreement. close on that. That's called the A to B. Mm -hmm. That's the A to B contract. So that's between the seller and the wholesaler, right? And then when we find our buyer, we're gonna have the, another purchase and sales agreement. So in the double close is essentially two purchase and sales agreements. It's a purchase and sales agreement between the wholesaler and the seller, which is me buying the property from you. And then there's an agreement between the wholesaler and the buyer, which is the buyer buying the property from me. Mm -hmm. But the difference is you need to have funds in order to make that first purchase between the buyer and the, the wholesaler and the seller. Mm -hmm. And you can use transactional funding for that, or you can use um, pass-through funding for that if the attorney yeah, allows Yeah, it. I was say, usually the attorney, that's why you need a good relationship. Uh, yep. They might allow the pass-through funding. Yep, the pass-through funding. And the pass-through funding is good because when you, the difference between the two, pass-through funding is essentially the buyer's funds Funding your the first <laughs> the first transaction, the A to B it's transaction. It's a wild, wild west, man. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you do the transactional funding, then you have to find a lender, yeah. and then you have to pay a fee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fees are usually about 1%. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, you want to find those transactional fund. You want to find those title companies that allow to pass through funding so you don't have to pay that fee. Yeah. Now, another tip, too, on the, <laughs> on the double close, to put a little bit more money in your pocket, remove that title insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cause that title insurance that can save you about a thousand bucks. Yeah, you know, put a thousand bucks in your pocket. You, you don't need it. And, and so it's it's so funny because like in the beginning of when I was in wholesale, and I never understood it. But you know, when we had these conversations more, I could start to see why the bougie realtors don't really like wholesalers, <laughs> and they why, why they call it the wild wild west because yeah, we have these janky processes of getting mm -hmm. the deals done, right? That seem, is our process janky or theirs? Right. Which one, right? <laughs> it's all perspective yeah. at this point. But it's interesting that you said you like assignments because, you know, it does make sense because they faster. Mm -hmm. But for us, we always preferred it because we had more, um, it might sound crazy to say, but it was less transparency with the double closing. It's like mm -hmm. meaning, yeah. you know, the buyer don't have to see what you got the contract right. for. So right. we'll do like assignments when we got like those small baby deals, like a 5K, right. 10K deal. Right. You know, we'll do an assignment. Because like, we don't care if you see we got it for 150 and we're right. selling it to you for 160. Right. But when it was those deals where, you know, we got it for 150. 40, we, 50K. 40, 50K deals. Yeah. Like, ooh, we might have to double close this because. Yeah. We don't want nothing to go they wrong. They're going to go for the reduction. <laughs> right, <laughs> They see right. we get 50 bands on it. Yeah, so I look at it like, and that's when, and that's how we determine, you know, that's how most people determine whether or not to use an assignment or a double close if it's mm -hmm. solely up to the wholesaler, right? Is okay, how much money, how much is my spread on this deal? Mm -hmm. Now, if my spread is over a certain amount or at a certain amount and I don't want the seller to know or I don't want the buyer to know what my spread is, then I'm going to do a double close. Mm -hmm. If I don't care and I don't give a shit, then I'm gonna just do an assignment. You know what I mean? So it's really interchangeable how you wanna look at it. For us, we don't care. Yeah. If we can do an assignment, we're gonna get that assignment and get it done real quick and just run it that way without having to do all this transaction and two closings and all that. Mm -hmm. And then another thing with the double close, you actually own that property for a split second. For a split second, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cause you close first. So man, it's interesting cause we getting, we getting into a lot of the meat and potatoes mm -hmm. and the, you know, the nuances of wholesaling. But before we even dive in deeper, bro, what I want to do is I want to even identify who this will even be a good fit for. Because mm -hmm. you got a lot of people, you know, especially with our audience, a lot of them are nine to fivers as well, mm -hmm. side hustlers in there mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, and just like you said in the beginning, you was working a eight to five and then coming home, putting another two hours, three mm -hmm. hours into your side hustle at the time. Mm -hmm. um, what were some transferable skills that you identified um, that – because you said it was some similarities from what mm -hmm. you were doing with the trucking business to, to this. Mm -hmm. What were those transferable skills? And then how can our audience identify those same transferable skills to see if this is even something that they could entertain as a side hustle? Right. It's, it's talking to people. Mm. Right. That's in, in relationships because that's what it's all about. People work with people that they know, mm -hmm. like and trust. Everybody heard that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's it's nothing. There's nothing false about that. So. If you're able to have a conversation with somebody, right, you, you, you talk to them, 
if you if I know you, if I like you, and then at the end of the day, if I trust you, I'll do business with you. So being able to have conversations, being genuine, being authentic, being transparent, right? Having good intentions with every conversation. I feel like most people can do that without a problem. Yeah. And that's a skill set that everybody has if they want to apply that, mm. right? I always look in the good in people before I look in the bad. Like I never look in the bad of people, no matter what people have done to me in my right. past, right? right? So initially, I'm saying, okay, if you can have a conversation, be genuine with people, hell, if you can read, because it started with me reading a script, right? Mm. Reading the script, because I didn't know what to say when I started out. So what I had to do, I had to go get a script mm -hmm. and read off my script, because anybody can do that. You're on the phone. Can nobody see that you're reading off a script, right? Obviously, they can probably tell that you're reading off a script. You got to get good at that. But though. you got to yeah. do it with yeah. repetition. You have to keep yeah. doing those repetition. So at the end of the day, one of the skills that you know you need is being able to read, obviously, being able to talk to people, and then effort, putting in the work, right? You have to consistently put in the work. No matter what the outcome is, don't worry about the timeline. Don't worry about the time frame. Put in the work consistently, mm -hmm. and results will come. Right. You're going to learn after every single conversation that you have, you're going to learn something. You're going to think, oh, I could have said this or I should have said this or I could have did this better or I could have took it this this way. And then the next time you have that conversation with somebody else, now you know how to apply that. So the only way you do that is by consistent repetition, consistent work and, and learning. Right. You have to be able to, to self teach yourself some of this stuff, too. Right. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you can get a mentor. Yeah, you can learn on YouTube. But you have to be able to put yourself in the fire and take that action because the real learning is going to come from the battlefield. Right. Like, oh, my mentor gave me this script. I'm putting this script into place. But this is happening. And this is happening this time. Do I need to tweak some things? Right. So I, OK. I because you can give you can give five different people a script, the same script. But those five different people, they're going to learn something different about themselves every time they mm -hmm. call and you go through that script. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you to put in that that work to figure out, okay, what do I need to learn about myself so I can get better? Yeah, You know what I mean? Because sometimes you might be afraid to talk to somebody on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I was too when I first started. Or afraid to drop the, that, that, that first price, that or, offer. Or afraid to make the call, on a, a bad call, right? Yeah. The, afraid to, to have that, that, ne that bad conversation, right? That, that conversation that people don't want to have. But you have to do it, it's part of business. And that's always, don't take it personal. Mm. It's business, right, at the end of the day. And whatever your your goal is, right, whatever you're trying to achieve, whether it's leave your nine to five, whether it's, you know, create a, a supplemented income, whether it's to start getting into the real estate space, whether it's becoming an entre entrepreneur, whether it's making more money, whatever it is, more time, whatever it is, you keep that goal in front of mind all the time mm. and everything else is just fall in place as long as you put in that work and the effort. Yeah. And one thing I want to add to that, because that was a, those are some great skills to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I identified within myself and was uh, good to just make note of was just having a curiosity too, mm -hmm. like not taking an answer and just be like, oh, okay. Right. Like if somebody tell you, oh yeah, I want to move because, you know, it's time for me to leave. Right. Right. Oh, okay, cool. Let me get you an offer. Like, why is it time for Keep you to pushing. leave? Like dig, yeah. learning to dig deep and ask mm -hmm. the right questions so that you can get as much information because the last thing you want is for that information or not knowing that information to bite you, to, bite you in the butt at closing. Absolutely. You know, and how many, how, like, let's talk about how often that might have happened for you. Like some information that might not have been, you know, uh, in the forefront mm -hmm. came back and kind of haunted you at closing or, or any situations like that. Yeah, not not necessarily at closing, but like this happens a lot when before you get in properties under contract, mm -hmm. right? So well, I give you a situation happened last week and I feel bad about it because it's like, dang, I, I usually I'm on top of it. You know, I'm on top of my game. Mm -hmm. So whenever a seller, you know, you're talking to a homeowner, right? And, you know, they want to sell the property, right? So in this situation, I actually went out to look at the house, right? What I should have did was before I made my offer, before I wasted my time to go look at the damn house in person, <laughs> right? This is before I go on the contract. I should have asked this dude, like I normally do, is there anybody else that, you know, you need to speak to before making this final decision to sell the property? Mm. Oh, damn. Right? Trying to find out who that other decision maker or that influencer of his decision was. Because then what happens, fast forward two weeks later, I get, finally get him back on the phone I make him the offer. He said, I need to speak to my wife. I wish I would have known that beforehand. Yeah. Because then when I get him back on the phone, again, after he speaks to his wife, 
he goes and says, well, you know, I want to sell it, but she wants to hold on to it for, you know, another six months. First of all, what the hell is another six months going to do? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So if I would have addressed that on the forefront, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have wasted my time going all the way out to the property, seeing this dude house, following, chasing him down, trying to get him back on the phone just for him to tell me he's not ready to sell because that's not what he told me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's on me. And that yeah. bit me in my ass because I wasted, hell, it was a 45-minute drive there and back. So that's two hours out my day, yeah. damn near three hours out my day, trying to deal with this guy and then hunt him down. Yeah, because then you there talking to him, you know, inspecting the house yep. and everything like that. And so you you mentioned because you now going out to properties, and at first you know you was you know paying people to go go out there mm -hmm. for you. What cha like what changed in the market or what changed in your business to where you now personally want to go out to these properties? It really just depends, right? So it depends on the area. So the properties that I don't physically go out to. They're further away, right? Okay. Um, the properties that I physically go out to, if I'm going to go there and actually meet the seller and I believe this is going to be a, a deal and I can close it, that's the ones I'm going to go to, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to those in person. Like this, this house that I'm talking about, it was in Lawrenceville, right? And Lawrenceville is a very sought-after sought area, right? The, mm -hmm. pro the property and the, situ the seller situation was, was, was good too, right? He was rehabbing it. The tenants were, 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 were bad. They messed up the house. He was repairing it, renovating it. He ended up running out of money. His contractor kind of ran off on him, mm. and the house has been sitting. So it's some pain in there. It's a lot of pain in there. He don't even want to deal with it no more. He don't really want to deal with it anymore. So that's why I said, oh, that's urgent. Let me go out there myself mm -hmm. so I can go ahead and take this thing to the finish line and close it. But I bit myself in the ass by not asking him if there is somebody else that's influencing oh, the decision. Same, dude. same guy. Oh, damn. Yeah, oh, same man. guy. But, you know, to really answer your question as far as like what determines, you know, whether I go out there or if I send somebody out there to do it for me, it really just depends on the situation of the property, where the property's at. It, it really just depends. Yeah. So like if it's like if it's gonna be worth your time, if, if it's you gonna feel be worth like my time. You you make that pretty much if you, you decide if you make the biggest difference on closing the deal and not closing the deal. Mm -hmm. And if you make that difference, then it's worth the drive. Yeah. You got you. You got you. That makes a lot of sense. Would you advise that for every wholesaler to no. cuz not everybody what for what reasons because I'm not a, like starting out I would advise to go look at property so you get your feet wet so mm -hmm. you can kind of get comfortable with being in front of a seller and taking pictures while the seller's there and it gives you a good opportunity to build rapport and build a relationship while you're there in mm -hmm. their presence because a lot of times people going to work with people that they can match the face with the name right so if they can match you and you having a conversation um I feel like you have a better chance of getting that deal closed as far as getting that contract signed. Now, when it comes to, um, you know, if doing it all the time, I wouldn't recommend that because that's your time. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're going to waste so much time doing that. So, you know, I would always look at it if the deal makes sense, right? If in this case, this seller, he didn't have an asking price. He didn't know what he wanted. He didn't do any research, apparently, right? Um, and I made the initial offer on the phone. He was like, oh, okay, that might work, whatever. So it really just depends on the situation of the seller. But starting out, yes, go out there, meet the sellers, start taking a few photos so you can get comfortable because I get a lot of questions too, a lot of DMs about, you know, hey, I got this appointment with this seller. I don't know what to talk about. I don't know what to do and this and that. So I always recommend going out there. You know, you can talk about different things, right? You can, hey, my first question every time I go out to meet a seller at a property on appointment is, what's this, tell me the story on the house. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, you know, I've had it for 15 years and this and that and this and that. And then you can start building a relationship off of that. So um, just getting comfortable with the sellers in person, that's going to make you a better wholesaler in the long run. Yeah. I mean, it's starting to sound like 80% of the transaction really is your ability to build that rapport and maintain a relationship with both the seller and the buyers mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, we talked a little bit before, you know, uh, before this interview was just the abilities to also educate the sellers as well. Yeah. Do you feel like before that deal went sour, there were some things you could have educated the seller on or just speak to our listeners a little bit more about what it looks like to not just sell, mm -hmm. not just drop an offer, but to educate the sellers and how mm -hmm. important that is in the transaction too. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to educating the seller, so typically I do that most of the time when 
a seller is asking a price that's crazy, right? Mm. Or if I make an offer and the seller wants, you know, a, a significantly higher amount more than my offer, and I t- kind of let them know why my offer is what my offer is, mm-hmm. right? You know, and that's where the education comes in. You understand, and that's why it's important to understand what's going on in the real estate space, in the industry within your market, so you can then educate these sellers so it can bring them down to reality, mm. right? Because like we talked about, hedge funds a couple years ago inflated these sellers' minds, right? They inflated the market as well, but they inflated their minds too in certain areas. So as they're inflating their mind and they mark in the market, the seller's mindset is still on that from years ago, mm-hmm. right? But in re- reality, you have to let them know what changed because the market changes every day. Mm. You know what I mean? So if they're still thinking that their property is worth something that is not, then you have to let them know, hey, this is why. Well, the, the property's in the area. I'm looking at this house, this house, and this house in the same neighborhood, and they all sold for 300000 and all three of these were fixed up. And you're asking for 305. Tell me how that makes sense. Right. And your property, as you told me, your property needs updates on the roof. It needs updates inside the house. This property, these properties here, they're fixed up. A retail buyer bought these. So it doesn't make sense for us to pay you 305 when the property's <laughs> selling for 300,000. Yeah, a new roof costs this amount, you know, this costs right. this much. And just before I even take away fees and stuff, you're already at this price. Right. right? And like, then sometimes you got to be upfront with them too, right? And we, we, we tell them, say, hey, you know we're, we're investors. We're not looking to live in this property ourselves. So we may not be a good fit for you at this price. Our, our, our job, we're here to make money too. But at the same time, we're trying to help you. And that's why it's important to, to focus on the situation and try to find these sellers who have situations that they need to get out of versus just talking to sellers that's, Eh, I can sell it if I want to. Yeah. Or you know, if if the number makes sense, I'll sell it. Oh, that's those real. are the sellers you, you don't want. Yeah, right yeah, those are the people you really don't want to waste your time with, especially if they living in the house. Yeah. Because they're not going nowhere unless you offer them something crazy, and you're not going to do that. So mm-hmm. those people we don't waste our time on. You want to focus on the homeowners that have a situation or they're in some form of form of distress that they need to get out of, and those are the people that the higher the distress. The, the, the more pr- the price is negotiable. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The lower the distress, the price is not negotiable. Right. So if they're in a situation that they need some help, whether they're behind on mortgage or where they have to relocate fast or whatever the case may be, house falling apart, whatever the case may be, that price is more negotiable than somebody who is just living good. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really hard to negotiate a price where the seller don't even got a price in the first place. It, it is. Because they was never even thinking about selling. They comfortable where they at. Yep. So you just kind of talking to a tree at that point. Right. And you don't want to waste your time. Not at all. So you mentioned understanding, like, in order to educate, obviously you need to understand the market. You need to understand these situations. And in understanding the market, where are you going to get this information about, like, the hedge fund situations? Are are they buying? Are they not buying? The inflation and prices, uh, interest rates increases. Like, where are you gathering this intel to then be able to not only educate these sellers, but really to educate yourself on how to be a better buyer and seller as well. So what I do is I set up Google alerts on my phone. Mm. So, and it's about the market and the real estate market. So I get articles daily about the market. So it can be from the, you know, the Association of Realtors, National Association of Realtors. They might send something about what's going on in the market. Um, It could be CNN. It can be articles from wherever. I get those every single day, and I look at those, right? Um, Bankrate is a good website, too, for, you know, the interest rate, seeing what the current interest rates are in the market. So every day I look at that and kind of see what's going on in the market. On top of, you know, our own flips and that we're doing, right? We put properties on the market so we get an idea of what's going on with the market based off of the the reaction from the buyers that we're dealing with, right? So mm-hmm. I'm putting my mind... By doing these flips, I put my mind in in the in the mind of a buyer and seeing what they're going through. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So if I was a wholesaler deal to a buyer, I know what they're going to experience. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So by doing that, it gives me a little bit more knowledge and information about what's actually going on holistically that I can then educate the sellers and let them know. Say, hey, we got a couple properties on the market right now. They're not selling for what we thought they're going to sell for. This is what's happening, and this is why. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the price that you're asking is not going to – 
you know, makes sense for us. In this and point. I'm sure that also helps you communicate the value mm-hmm. of the deal to the buyers too. Mm-hmm. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, those Google alerts. How are you then using this information? How does that play a part of how you market the property? Once you got a deal on the contract, how are you marketing these properties? Is there a technique or is there a sauce or a code that you follow to market to, to buyers or is it different every time? It's pretty much different every time. The key is you got to have the right buyers, right? Mm. One, you have the right buyers. And then two, you have to make sure you get the property at a price that a buyer is going to want to pay for it, yeah. right? Because if you don't have, if the property is priced right, somebody will buy it. If it's not priced right, then it's not going to sell. So at the end of the day, your ability to find deals on the front end, actual deals where the prices make sense for somebody to purchase it, that's going to be the value there, right? Now, when it comes to marketing it out to buyers, there's so many different ways you can do it. Um, and a deal will sell itself. A deal will sell itself. Mm. If, the, if the number makes sense and everything looks good, it'll sell itself. So as far as marketing to the buyers, you have to, be, you have to div- diversify that, right? You have to, sometimes you may have to get on the horn and, and start, banging out some calls to buyers yourself that you don't even have on your list, right? Some new buyers, whether it's finding them on a, on a software, you can call them on there, you can skip trace them, you can find their information, contact them there, going to real estate events, right? Networking events, because a lot of real buyers and flippers and investors, they go to those events to look for deals, right? So connecting with people there. Um, and when it comes to that, people got to start getting out of their shell, right? Be mm-hmm. more open, you know, be more intentional about meeting people, right? Mm-hmm. Because like I said, this real estate thing is all about relationships. It's a team sport. So the more people you're connected with, the more relationships you can cultivate, the better off you'll be. So if you're sitting off thinking you can do this by yourself, you, you're mistaken, right? Mm. So being able to get into the room with other investors at real estate v- meetups and real estate events and exchanging contact information, identifying who's buying, identifying who's flipping, that's going to uh, give you some opportunities to sell deals to those people. Um, Also connecting with real estate agents, right? Because some real estate agents, they have a network of investors that they represent because there's some buyers that only buy through their real estate agent. Mm. So being able to connect with those real estate agents, they may be able to connect you with those buyers that only work with them solely, right? Right. So, um, and also you can do the Facebook marketing and all these different things and and whatnot, but those are just some ways that you can find buyers and market to them. Now, would you say that before this whole uh, wholesale gig, that you were naturally like an extroverted person, kind of like outgoing, going to networking events before? No, not no. at all. So this is like something that you had to like teach yourself and be more intentional on. I had to be more intentional. I had to identify that with myself. Right. Right. I had to, because I'm an extrovert when I'm around people that I know, mm-hmm. right, that I'm comfortable with. And I'm pretty sure that's what everybody, for the, the majority of people, I think a majority of people are more introverted than extroverted, right? Mm. So, especially now in this day of social media, too. We, right. We condition to more introverts now. Right, yeah. right. So it's like, for me, I had to put myself in the field, right? If I wanna be a player in the field, I gotta get in the game. Mm. And the only way you get in the game is you show face, you show up. You know, part of it is showing up. So, You know, and now realize that that helps me. Like, it's not going to hinder me at all. Like, what's hindering me is not going to these things. Not because I went to, like, one of our buyers, you know, he's also a a, a private money lender for us. He's also a buyer. We sold him four or five deals, and he lent us money on four or five deals. Without him, we wouldn't make any money. But I met him at one of these events. I end up going to an event, putting my pride aside and all this and that, going to an event, getting out of my shell, and talking to the guy, hey, I'm a wholesaler, I do deals, can I get your phone number? You know what I'm saying? And that's essentially how it worked. And he, I asked him, what's his criteria? Where are you looking for deals at? And sure enough, he said, I'm looking for deals here, here, and here. Just contact me if you got anything. And that was that. And that changed the game for us. Yeah, that's super interesting, man. And it's, it's like, it's a trend here that it don't matter what the industry is. Like, if you want to be successful or you want to be a heavy hitter in your industry, you got to learn how to network mm-hmm. and collab and work together with other people. Like I, even when we first got started, like joint ventures, JV deals was the, was the main thing that kind of helped us get that momentum in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of solopreneurs that stepping into the wholesale. And I'm sure that was true for you as well. You know, kind of jumping into some JV deals helped you build some yep. momentum and, you even mentioned your current business partner. You mm-hmm. know, you guys established a relationship through networking and yep. doing some JV deals together. Talk about that experience and kind of uh, how that came about. Yeah, so me and my business partner, um, 
you know, my my whole thing on social media, when I first got started wholesaling, I was just documenting my journey, right? Mm -hmm. I would get on Instagram, I would get on Instagram Live, and I would just cold call, cold call, cold call. And it's on there till this day. You can see my progress from yeah. when I first started to now, right? You can see my growth. And he reached out to me, you know, and he con contacted me and said, hey, bro, I like what you're doing. Um, you know, I'm still in, I'm, I'm beginner as well. I'm working as well. You know, I'm moving down to the city soon. You know, maybe we can do some JVs th together, whatever. And I said, yeah, for sure. You know, now I don't, I didn't really think much of it because most, uh, I got that a lot, right? He wasn't the first person to say something like that. Like, mm -hmm. hey, let's do some JV deals together. But what's th what made him stand out was he was persistent and he was consistent and he would always provide value, mm -hmm. right? So he would tell me what he learned he, and he would, tell me something new and then I would tell him and I would, we would exchange value mm -hmm. and we would keep that communication going. So then when he moved down here, um, pretty much what happened was I was still working my eight to five job and he had just moved down. So he didn't have a gig at the time. So I told him, I said, listen, man, I'll give you access to all the leads that I had brought in on my, in my, in my database. It was like 120 leads. I said, you can call them, contact them. Any deals that you get on the contract that we close, we split 50, 50. Literally two weeks later, he got a deal on a contract. It was for like eight grand. We split that 50 50. The next deal was like 17,000, mm. split it 50 50. Then the next one was, I think it was like 7,500, split it 50 50. And from there, we was like, all right, what are we doing? Mm, so you now in a position where you like, okay, I got this guy who I feel like I can trust. Mm -hmm. I'm still working this job. Mm hmm. These calls is kind of kicking my ass because I working can't the make job. right. You exactly. can't make all these calls. Exactly. You probably got this list. You intend on calling them, but you probably call like two, three, four a day. Exactly. And he was like, "I got this guy right here who's trusted. He got time. He got time. Mm -hmm. Let me put him on the phones. Mm -hmm. And then you now is you probably stepped into a role now of like if you get a deal on the contract, you just going to dispo him. Mm -hmm. So I got you, got you. That's super creative on you know how that relationship started. Yeah, and it started on trust. Yeah, right. That was the first thing. Like. For anybody to give somebody access to everything that, access that, to that I, what I work for. He could have ran off. He could have ran off with them. Yeah, man. So that's why we always, you know, I always tell them, like, our, our relationship was built off of trust. And, like, I always don't, I always think about the good in people before I think about yeah. the bad. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to be. Because if you would have thought, like, ooh, he might run off. Next time you talk to him, he probably even feel the, 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 the dissonance in your right. voice and how you don't really trust him. And that could have made everything go right. sour. Well, I offered it. Mm. You see what I'm saying? I offered. I said, hey, man, how about we do this? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like I said, I always look for the good in people initially because if you start being, oh, well, I, I can't trust you, I can't trust Let people give you a reason not to trust them. Right. You know what I'm saying? Don't just off, just don't just come off not trusting people off the rip. Facts. Let people give you a reason not to trust them. And then from there, you can dictate whether or not you want to work, move forward with this person or not. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, and that's how it worked out. Yeah, man, it's, it's so tricky nowadays because, like, in our music and movies and just the media is like we're given reasons not to trust people before we even meet them, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's black or white, gay or straight, or just like even black people in in our in our tight communities, right? Right? They we was told not to trust each other, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like can't trust no it, nigga no, bro. It's like <laughs> we just in, ingrained that into our brains that it's like. It's not innocent until proven guilty anymore. It's guilty until proven innocent. That's I gotta crazy. bend over backwards yeah. to show that I'm that I'm loyal to you. It's like that's crazy. It's wild. But the way you thinking about it, show it obviously shows some proof of concept. Yeah, you know, proof of concept. And then obviously, like you have to do your due diligence too, right? Like I said, he was trusting me with information that he was giving me, mm -hmm. right? It was an exchange of value. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, day one, hey bro, you can have all access. Right. right. That's not the trust I'm talking about. I'm talking about trusting somebody that you feel has good intentions as well, right? Mm -hmm. And the intentions were pure, the intentions were good, so that's when we made a decision to kind of move forward and, and, and go from there. Yeah, so fast forward now, y'all been in y'all been in business together for about how long? About, I think we're going into, uh, we started in 2021, so this, we'll be going into our third year, so like two and, two and a half years. Okay, okay, so 2021, this is now like, Post COVID, well, really like in the middle of COVID, because mm. COVID was about two years, right? 2020. Was I don't know. Are we still in a pandemic? Right. We I still might even be. Who knows, right? <laughs> so it was like you in this situation where COVID is creating a lot of volatility in the real estate market 
where one day it's a buyer's market, the next week it's a seller's market, mm -hmm. and it's just flip flop. No, don't nobody really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. In that in that in a time like that, how were you guys pivoting y'all's efforts and making deals shake? You know, changing your you know outreach, just changing mm -hmm. uh, some your, your your strategies, your mm -hmm. exit strategies, whether it was the mm -hmm. wholesale deal. I know we talked about you guys getting the flips. Mm -hmm. What were some things that y'all had to change, and how quick was the pivot? Yeah, so once everybody got the notification that these whole that the the hedge funds were out because the hedge funds were the money makers. Yeah. Everybody know. Everybody wanted. The everybody hedge wanted a hedge fund. I just need one hedge fund. I'm yeah. good. And all you just need one hedge fund. Everybody was on that, right? <laughs> But all the hedge funds stopped at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they all follow suit. Yeah. And that's what put everybody in limbo. And when we realized it, the crazy thing is, bro, here's a story for you. We actually, one of our hedge fund contacts, we actually took him out to dinner in Miami. We flew down to Miami. Mm -hmm. We took him to a steak dinner in Miami. This was like in November of 2021. Mm -hmm. We ran it up with him for like, Four or five months. Yeah, and that's point. This point, y'all still new in business too. Still new in business, yeah. right? This is towards the end of the end of the year. We took them to the steak dinner in, in November. Come January, they stopped buying. <laughs> At that moment, that's when we knew like we needed to shift on what we were doing, and that's when we started getting into uh, different exit strategies. Right? We started contemplating and thinking about different exit strategies. So what we did was one one thing that we did was we invested into uh, a mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. We spent about twenty grand on a mentorship, right? Makes sense because we needed to learn from somebody that was doing it at a higher scale than us, right? And mm -hmm. seeing what they what their operations were doing. So we invested into mentorship. What we did also was we we changed exit strategies, right? We started implementing hotels, so we'll buy a property and just put it on the market, right? Um, without doing any work to it, you know, we get it at a discount price, whatever, we hotel it. Um, we also started doing flips that year, uh, which we did our first flip, it was successful. We, I think we made like 68 grand on it, the okay. first one. So we started doing flips. Um, because if the hedge funds weren't buying, that's that was our primary buyers because the other local buyers, they weren't buying as high as the hedge funds either. So we started focusing on trying to get more local buyers because the hedge funds buyers, they, they stopped, right? Mm -hmm. So. We was like, okay, we get we 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 get more hedge, more local buyers. We focus on building relationships with local buyers and things like that because they're still going to buy, right? Because that's their business. They're going to buy regardless. They just have to buy at a lower price. So we focused on building that list or that database of local buyers. We also focused on uh, different sub markets, right? Because we knew that the hedge funds inflated the Metro Atlanta market. So we started focusing on different sub markets outside of Metro Atlanta that investors were investing in, right? Mm -hmm. um, like areas with a military base and things like that, right? So we started focusing on sub markets. And then we also shifted the type of properties that we were targeting or the type of people that we were targeting. Okay. With the hedge funds, we were targeting their criteria, right? Which stopped, which messed us yeah, up, right? right? So what we shifted was we shifted and started targeting people who were really in a distressful situation, right? Certain price points, lower price points, um, the length of how long they owned the property, how old the property was, because hedge funds, they had a limit on what how old the property was, um, certain areas, things along those lines. And we just ramped up our marketing too, right? So you had to increase our marketing. So those are some things that we kind of did to adjust to, you know, to the market shifting as it did when they left the market. Yeah, yeah, and then you talk about... Um the sub markets, I'm sure that played a huge part too, because you got out of a market that most people consider very saturated mm -hmm. and into a sub market that most people was like, like I told you, we weren't those markets yeah. that you said you was doing deal. I'm like, ah, oh, we stayed away from those deals because it yeah. was on the shelf a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So talk about that. Like, what was the was that what was the mindset behind going to these sub markets? Was it to just get into a less saturated market, or was that because that's where you saw a lot of those, the criteria of these older homes, more distressed yeah, sellers. Yeah, so it was a combination of the two, right? So when you go to a, a, a sub market, one, is easier to get deals under contract, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and there's gonna be a higher volume of it. The, the pros and cons to it is easier to get a deal under contract, you can have more volume as far as closing the deals, but the, the con to it is, the profit is not going to be, gonna be the spread isn't going to be as big, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get a smaller spread. So like in Atlanta market, you getting $20,000 spreads like that, right? And these sub markets, 
you know, you getting anywhere between five to twelve, depending. If twelve is a kinda real like good I, one, that's kind of like how Alabama was for us. Yeah, twelve mm-hmm. is a good is a good spread, you know. Yeah. But on average, you're probably looking around eight grand, mm-hmm. you know, in those spreads. But that's why it's, it's more volume. So the more you do, obviously, it, it, it kind of balances out, yeah. right? So um, it was that. It was also the fact that the the hedge funds inflated the the prices of the metro Atlanta market and also inflated the the perspective, the mindset Give of the big sellers. Head. <laughs> yeah, of the sellers, right? Yeah. It inflated that reality. So the hedge funds weren't in these sub markets, right? So in these sub markets, the regular, you know, it's just regular people, they don't know what's going on. They may get calls here and there, but they're not getting calls every day. In the Metro Atlanta market, people are getting calls every day. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm still getting calls and I don't even <laughs> like homes that we don't even have no more. I'm like, what, what the fuck? Right. So like with that, you know, that's that was the mindset into going into the sub markets because we felt like we can build our own little hub there. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Where we can be a big player in the sub market versus trying to be a big player in the big market where other people are coming in from out of state, out of the country, investing in those markets. They have more marketing dollars. Like we could spend less marketing dollars in the sub market and get good returns versus spending more marketing dollars in the major market and get less return. Mm-hmm. And um, were y'all doing the flips in these sub markets too? Or nah. y'all, y'all stay y'all stay more local. Yeah, okay. we stay local in the Got flips. You. Yeah. For a wholesaler to do a flip, though, I mean, you guys done it once, you guys done it twice, and I'm sure mm-hmm. many times over at yeah. this point. When is a good? When should a wholesaler consider doing a flip? Like. Is because you need the capital now at this point yep. to do flips. Need the capital. So how many deals or do they need to close before they think about doing flips? Or should they just go straight into maybe going the lender route? Like what's the what's the process for a wholesaler to do a flip? I, th- I think it's going to be different depending on the wholesaler because we did it a different route, right? We utilized our lender. We was just in a different situation, right? We built a relationship with a private money lender. Mm, which okay. was actually one of our cash buyers, right? Yeah, so yeah. he bought four or five deals from us. And then worked. And so then, that pretty much was another JV. It was another <laughs> JV, right? So, okay. and he lended us money on these deals to flip, right? Mm-hmm. So um, we cultivated that relationship. Now, if you're going to go the, the, the hard money route, getting a loan that way, you're going to have to have some capital in the bank, right? So obviously you got to close some deals, and have some, because they're gonna want what they call skin in the game, right? They're gonna want you to put some skin in the game, which means they want you to put some money up. So, you know, they're gonna look at your your bank account and see how much money you have in your account, how much capital you have. And I would suggest having around 50 grand in capital in your bank account Mm -hmm. if you're gonna go with that hard money route. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, If you're able to do that, then you're gonna have to, obviously you're gonna have to bring some money to the closing table to, because they will fund, depending on the, the, the company, they will fund, up to 80 percent right so you need 20 or more yeah they're going to fund up, up to 80 percent so you need at least 20 20 more percent ready to for closing and they'll fund purchase and they'll fund rehab if you find the right one they'll fund the whole purchase and they'll fund the whole rehab but you have to bring some money to the closing table um to close that deal so i would say if as a wholesaler if you want to get into flips if you want to you know, start flipping properties. Obviously, you want to educate yourself first, mm-hmm. right? You definitely want to educate yourself. I would say go, um, go find somebody who's been very successful at flips, who's been doing it for a long time, who knows the ins and outs of flips. Find you a good contractor. Don't skimp on the contractor. Find you a contractor that has licenses, not somebody with a, a, a van and a ladder on it and a decal on their truck. Find somebody who is a legit contractor because if you go cheap on the contractor, it'll bite you in the ass later on. Mm. So that's a lesson that I learned. So go get you a contractor that's proven, that has a good track worker, that does everything by the books. It's paperwork attached to everything that they do. You're going to get your invoices. You're going to get your receipts. You're going to get everything you need, right? Get you a good contractor. Uh, Understand repairs, right? Do inspections on these properties that you're looking for. Right. Make sure you get inspections on the properties and see what really needs to be done to these properties for them to sell on the back end. Mm. Right. Um, Also, when you're doing flips, you want to make sure that you really know the numbers because the numbers is what matter. Right. Be conservative on your ARV. Right. So make sure if you see an ARV for two hundred fifty thousand, you know, if the property can sell for two fifty thousand, do your numbers off two forty. 
right? So you want to make sure you buy it at the right price, you know, because the, the profit, you make money when you buy it, not when you sell it. So if you do your numbers and do your due diligence on the front end, then you'll be able to make the money on the back end. So, yeah, yeah as a wholesaler, if you want to get into flips, those are some things that I recommend. Um, it's not all glitz and glamour. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. It's not all glitz and glamour. It's, it, it can be stressful at times, but if you, you 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 take heed on what I'm putting out there, then it'll work out. Yeah, it's not it's not HGTV. No, it's <laughs> not. It's not. Hey, that's crazy, man. So we getting ready to uh, you know just transition it a little bit as we wrapping things up, Ty. And mm -hmm. you know, so far, like I could validate everything you saying is like one thousand percent game. And I really want our our listeners to heed the advice and the experiences that you've been sharing because. Mm -hmm. You know the main thing you've been you've been spitting is take action. Take right? action. Like, don't just don't just leave it at this at this conversation. Don't just leave it at this uh, this one hour that you spent with us. But actually take action into some of these things and just try it and put it into effect for yourself and see how it works. Um, so just transition a little bit, Ty. I am curious. Like with the, I'm sure you get a lot of frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. And now that you have done it, you know you have the experience. Now you stepped into a more of a role where you want to educate and give some of the game that to give even more game that you've been given today. What are some of the frequently asked questions that kind of, I guess, made you interested or want to start, you know, more of an educational business of wholesaling and getting people the game that they need to have successful wholesale careers? Good question. So it's not more, it's not about the questions I was been getting asked. It's more so about when I started. Mm. Right. I was when I started, I had to go hunt and get information from from people. And then, you know, there's people out there that I asked information from that, you know, they were pretty successful in the business. I ain't going to name no names, mm -hmm. but I'm probably sitting in their DMs asking a question and they left me on red. Mm. So that right there let me know, OK, people need help out here. And then, you know, the people who are doing it, supposedly doing it, they aren't giving the help like just freely right they just they just kind of push you to the forefront to the to the side right so that's what really got me into it but as far as like a frequently asked question it's always how do i get started oh just just how you get started what's the first step what do i need to do and i always tell people the first step is obviously you got to take action the first step is you need to find you and start putting together lists of properties and getting people to call or contact that's the first step. However you do that is on you, right? And here's some ways you can do it. You can drive for dollars in your neighborhood. Look for distressed properties. What I mean by distressed properties, they have tarps on the roof, uh, overgrown grass. They have trash in the driveways, busted windows, mm. properties that you probably wouldn't even live in. Mm. You take down those addresses. You can do this physically or you can do it from your computer on Google Satellite, mm. right? You can also go to, you can search cold violations in whatever city or county or whatever market that you're in on Google and request to get a list of properties that have current open cold violations on them, right? These people, you may have to call, you may have to email, you may have to call, email three or four times. You may have to go up to them physically in person to get this list, right? It's public record, they can provide you that information. That's another way you can get a list of properties. There's also software, right? Software, you can, you know, use your prop streams, your prop wires, uh, REI pros, all these different websites to download a list of property addresses that you can then call. So step number one is getting property addresses and getting people to call, creating lists of people to call. Step number two, I would recommend to get, up, get out of that fear of calling and to get your reps in, Go on Zillow, go on Realtor.com, go on Facebook, look at for sale by owners and call those people. They already want to sell their property, mm -hmm. right? So have a conversation with them, use the scripts and have a conversation with them and, and make your offer mm -hmm. and get your reps in. I have a video on YouTube where I'm getting cussed out by a for sale by owner, but I was getting my reps in. Right. You know what I'm saying? So doing that. And that's the first step to really getting started, right? You have to start building lists and you have to market to those lists and contact those people. Once you start building your list and market to those people and contacting those people and having conversations, then you're going to start seeing some results of people who want to sell their property. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can take the, the next steps that are appropriate. Yeah, that's real, man. And, and shout out to you, man, for always providing the, the, the realness too behind oh, yeah. you. You know, doc, just documenting your story. 
You know, I shared that with you last time we had you on was one thing that caught my attention was you can go scroll, scroll, scroll for days through your profile. And you got videos, testimonies, you know, videos of you on the phones, you mm -hmm. know, you document, you actually document the journey. And that's a quality that I feel like people should always look for when looking for a mentor. You know, looking working with people that's actually doing it, not doing just it. the person who got the pretty ads. Right, the pretty you know? ads and all the fancy cars that they rented. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't <laughs> want to just look at them like, oh, they gotta, they gotta be successful. They doing all this. It's like yeah. you, you want to actually see the proof of concept. Yeah, and you providing that proof of concept on your YouTube, on your on your IG, and everything like that. Uh, so shout out to you for bringing that realness. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like the resources, you mentioned a couple times like running with a script. You know, having these mm -hmm. resources in front of you so that you can be able to take action mm -hmm. um, and not everybody's savvy enough to like, you know, craft their own script. Is that something that you provide in your community in, in the discord and stuff like that? Like those resources yeah. or is that in the course? Yeah, it's, it's in the course, it's in my discord. And I also, I, I, I have it for free for the listeners as well. So oh, okay. if anybody wants a script, uh, I'm pretty sure Keith leave it in the link uh, so you can get that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so the community in my discord is, it has all the resources that anybody begin to need it needs or anybody who's closed a few deals it's a community of wholesalers mm -hmm. i don't from people who've closed nothing to people who've closed a lot of deals there's it's, it's a range of knowledge and information in there that you can get so if you're brand new mm -hmm. and you know you don't have to you don't feel alone in there because there's other people in there as well that's exactly where you are and it's a, a way for people to connect and and network together and also get the guidance that they need to, to get to that next level or get to that next deal, mm -hmm. right? And also, you know, for the people who uh, are more seasoned in there, these are people who they they, they just want to give back, right? They want to help, right? They, they just authentically just give back and genuinely just give information and help other people out who started because we understand that you need the help, right? We understand what it's like to be a beginner. We understand what it's like to not have all the answers. So, um, the, the seasoned veterans in our group, they are always open and willing to give that information for anybody who's new or has any questions mm -hmm. about a situation that they're dealing with or um, a, a specific situation, right? Because sometimes I can't address a specific situation all the time. So I have my vets, they're in there and they'll address it and give their perspective or their mm -hmm. opinion. And then I'll come and give my perspective and my opinion as well. So mm -hmm. it's just a, a, a beautiful community, man. Yeah, man, I love it. I love to hear it, man. Community is definitely like, you just said it, like the networking, you mm -hmm. know, that's a huge part of that success. So you building a community where, you know, people can come in and network. Yep. Maybe you can find some JV deals. I'm oh, sure. it's been happening. A lot of JV deals in your community. It's been happening. That's yep. what's up. And we can't skim over the fact that you, you you giving away some gas for free too. Like that script is big. You mm -hmm. know, it's, that, that's something that people guard tight. Right. You know, people don't want to give up <laughs> their they script. And you're giving that away to the community. Took me which, a while. Yeah, which I really appreciate. <laughs> and I'm sure our listeners is going to appreciate as well. And I really want to heed that y'all download that because the script is the, that's the GPS. Yeah. Right. Especially if you're just now getting started. Like you may not, you know what the goal is, but you may, may not know how to get there. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you want to get from Georgia to Alabama, but you don't know which route you should take. You don't know which route is going to be the fastest. That right. script is really that GPS that's going to help you walk your you walk yourself down that call. Exactly. So shout out to you for providing that uh, transitioning. You know, before we get you out of here, bro, I do want to ask this ask this a uh, couple more questions. Yeah. And this is not even related to you know wholesale what we've been talking about. You could make this one related, right. I guess. What up? Let's get um, to it. What I want you to come up with like a red pill, blue pill situation for our listeners, right? Mm -hmm. Like make them choose one or the other. Kind of like putting yourself in the position of Morpheus off of the Matrix, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what would that situation be if they had to choose between the red pill mm -hmm. and the blue pill? 850 credit score or a million dollars. Right now. Yeah. You, get, you could either get a 850 credit score is the red pill, mm -hmm. and then the blue pill is a million dollars cash. Right now. Is it taxed? Like, no, no, it's not taxed. Not taxed. A million dollars net. Okay. Okay. What do you choose? What do you choose? A fifty or a million dollars? Well, I should say, what's more valuable? Ooh. That's tough, right? Because we're gonna see where people where people minds at. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna vote. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep mine. I'm gonna keep mine. <laughs> That's a hard one. Nobody. Yeah, it's a hard one. It's a hard. One. It really depends on the situation too. Mm -hmm. Like the situation you in is really like you could tell the situation. If you already of a got person, an eight fifty. <laughs> yeah. Or if you just really down bad and you need some cash, it's like ain't nobody really trying to. Yeah, you get the eight fifty, but you still gotta 
Still got to get the funding. I don't know, but it's like it's like this, right? You can use the milli to get that 850 credit score. You could. You know what I'm saying? So whatever your credit score is, you can use something. You ain't got to use know, the whole million. Most people don't put it like that. Most people say you can use the 850 to get the milli, but most people don't say you can use the milli to get the 850 because you, you don't sure need, can. And you don't even need the whole milli to do it. Mm -mm, you know, look, just a little bit, especially you if you know what I know. If you know what you're doing, <laughs> you use the milli, some of the money from the milli to yeah. get that 850, and now that 850 can get you whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> you're not even using for for if you're really good. You're not even using a tenth of that milli to get that 850. Mm -mm. <laughs> so I just gave y'all the answer right there. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's a, that's some good gas right there, man. Shout out to you, man. You got all the gas uh, for for the audience today. Uh, let's say you walking out of here today and you just run past a spin image uh, of the 18 18 year old version of Ty, mm -hmm. right? What would be some advice you would get that young that young brother? Get started now. Mm. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Get started now. Take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. Um, network. Don't be afraid to get out your shell and network. You know, when I was, you know, 18 coming out, I, like I said, I was, I was introvert. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a shy guy. You know, I, I went to college. You know, I did. But I didn't do, I didn't network as much as I could have. Right. You know, um, I didn't get involved as much as I could have. You know, so... You know, get started now. If I would have learned about real estate back then, then I ain't no telling where I'd be right now. But everybody's journey is different, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't regret anything right. because it's all about God's timing. It ain't my timing. Mm -hmm. It's God's timing. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's more so about, you know, network more, get started, take action right now, you know, get out your shell. Um, don't hesitate. Don't wait. You know what I mean? And just it's just go for it. Yeah. Go for it. I love that, bro. And that's that's real too. It's like it's not it's not your timing. It's God's mm -mm. timing. You know, and a lot of people, you know, have regrets and they feel like, woe is me. And you know, I wish I would have did things Can't. differently. And no it's like pity. you you did what you did for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, you was put on that journey for a reason. And you gotta stay the course long enough to find out what that reason is. Exactly. And not stray off the course. That's the biggest thing, is just staying on the course. Right, and if so, you are feeling pity, you know, you just gotta take advantage of your opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, what happened, happened. You can't go back. Yeah. You can only write the future, right? You can only write your story to the end right now. Exactly. Whatever happened back then, that happened. Now it's time to change your story. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So don't pity yourself, just keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Man, so Ty, you got some amazing things in the pipeline, which I would love for you to share. You know, now's the time to, you know, one, tell our listeners about where they can find you, mm -hmm. uh, but also some some of those special things that you have going on, you mm -hmm. know, and some offers that you might have for the community outside of, of course, that script, which is, again, some gas. Yeah, for sure. So um, you can find me on Facebook at Ty Franklin. You can find me on Instagram at Ty the Investor. Um, also, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ty Franklin. Um on top of that, you know, that's I give a lot of free resources out on that, a lot of videos on, um, you know, my experiences, what I'm learning, what I'm doing, a lot of gems, man. I just mm -hmm. give a lot of gems. You guys would be surprised how many people uh, approach me and, and, and come to me in my DMs and message me every day and saying, bro, your videos helped me. Your videos did this. I learned this from your videos, this and that. And that's what I do it for, right? I want to see people win. So that's where all my free stuff come out at, right? I, I, I take the action. So you guys can learn from what I'm doing, whether it's whether it's good, bad, or, or ugly, right? I'm posting the good, I'm posting the bad, I'm posting the ugly because you can learn from all of it, mm. right? So um, definitely follow me in, on, on all those platforms. And then on top of that, uh, we already discussed my Discord, which is my Wholesale Unity Discord group. It's my community of wholesalers, investors. Uh, it's resources on there. We do monthly Zoom calls as well. Um, we also do deal breakdowns is what I really love about the group because every deal has its own story and there's gems to the deal. So with the deal breakdowns, you can see how people are closing deals. What are they doing differently that are closing deals? So then you can probably try it. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that about the group. So Discord community is great. If you have a specific situation that you're dealing with with a seller or a particular deal that you're working on, you can pose the question and you'll get the, the guidance and the counsel that you need. So mm -hmm. that's the, the most valuable part there. Um, and then lastly, I have um, my course. I just did a course in June. I dropped it in June. Uh, we got about 36 students in the course right now doing great, working through the course. And it's, it's no fluff course. It's step-by-step 
blueprint on how to close deals from A to Z. It provides everything you need, recorded calls that I've made. Uh, it has videos about walking through the contract, what to put on the contract, every single contract. It's six contracts. Mm. You think it's only two, mm -hmm. but it's six. Yeah. There's different contracts in there. Um, there's a whole bunch of valuable information. Then, then when you when you you know enroll in the class in the course, then obviously you get access to the Discord as well. So um, that's a win win right there. And yeah. then you know Zoom calls too if if you guys want Zoom calls. Yeah, hell yeah, that's heavy, bro. That's heavy, man. Well, Ty, I appreciate you, bro, for you know for hopping on here, for spending sure, your man. Saturday with us, and uh, man, just just a, a, another monumental conversation that I feel like the audience is really going to get a lot of game from. And uh, again, it all depends on if they're ready to take that action. You gotta take action. Gotta man. take action. You gotta take action. And so, for our listeners that are out there and ready to take action specifically, I wanna remind y'all to download that script today. Start taking action today. Yep. And also, don't forget to hit that like and that subscribe button. Share this with your potential business partner that you wanna wholesale deals with with as well right and uh again i just appreciate y'all you know for showing love showing out week in week out joining us for new episodes every monday when we drop them the clips dropping every friday and then now of course like i said we dropping those lives every tuesday where we giving y'all the game on content creation so even if you take the step into wholesaling of course you want to document your journey like ty did and you need some help with just how to structure your content how to monetize that content Make sure you join us on those lives every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And we'll see y'all there. But other than that, man, it's been great having you, Ty. Appreciate it. And I'm y'all guy, Kai Speaks. You just heard from Ty Franklin on wholesaling. And not even just wholesaling, but the fact that you can still wholesale in 2023 because it is not dead. It ain't dead. It is well and alive. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, I appreciate y'all having y'all. Y'all enjoy the rest of y'all day. Peace.